Good morning, everyone. Once again, welcome to Community Christian Church. As Sean said just a moment ago, it's so good to have you with us. You may or may not know this, but on Wednesday of this past week, it marked the 30-year anniversary of Community Christian Church. So happy anniversary. Back on February the 2nd, 1992, we held our very first worship service just down the street at Burr Elementary School. And we've been going strong ever since. So how about a huge round of applause for our great and faithful God. He's blessed us in so many different ways and we appreciate his commitment to us and his presence with us each and every day and each and every year. Now uh, we have a special anniversary celebration planned for April the 10th. What date? It's a Sunday, April the 10th, about two months from now. Uh, so mark that date down. Please uh, make plans to be with us. We'll tell you all about it in the very near future. We're, de we're knee deep in the middle of our first of the year teaching series entitled Letters from Jesus. And with this series, we're looking at the seven letters to the seven churches found in the book of Revelation, chapters two and three. And our goal is to not just become better acquainted with history. Our main objective, as we've been announcing from week to week, is to hear what Jesus is saying to the churches today. And I firmly believe that the revelation letters that we have in print in our Bible, the letters that were written a long time ago, back in the first century, they're still very much in play today. And those letters contain tremendous insight into what the Spirit of the Lord and what Jesus is saying to us right now. And so far in this series, we looked at Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamum and Thyatira. And I don't know about you, but I thought Pastor Chris and Joy both did an amazing job with their respective letters. Outstanding ministry. Today, we want to look at the church in Sardis. So, Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Jesus is speaking. John is writing. To the angel, or to the pastor of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. That's a a statement that Jesus made to all the churches. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Oh boy. <laughs> right off the bat, not very good. You have a reputation of being alive, but that's not the case. Uh, you're pretty much dead. So wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, what you've been taught. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis, precious brothers and sisters, who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white, and I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life. I want to read that last statement again. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. And whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, two quick stories, personal stories. Story number one. And now we're going way back. Years and years ago, about 45 years ago, my sister, not Donna, one of my other sisters, and I have five of them, she was moving from the house she lived in to a new location, and she asked me if I would be willing to store some of her furniture. 
And since I had a little extra space in the lower level of my house in the basement, I said, sure thing, no problem. And one of the items that she wanted me to store was her husband, my brother-in-law's, brand new set of golf clubs. And this was the kind of guy that had to have the best of everything. And his golf clubs were no exception. Top of the line, Titleist clubs. Uh, uh, all located in a brand new, shiny and gorgeous black and white Titleist golf bag. And I remember when I saw him for the first time, I was extremely impressed. It was like the nicest set of clubs I'd ever had seen before. And he had all the extras, and I think he paid like over $1,000 for his golf clubs. And that, again, was a long time ago. Well, I stuck the golf clubs in the corner of my basement, draped them with an old blanket for protection, and forgot about them until my good buddy, Pete Pappas, you know Pete, he called me and asked me if I wanted to play a round of golf. And I said, sure. And as I hung up the phone, my body just pointed me in the direction of my brother-in-law's golf clubs. And I took the blanket off and I thought to myself, do I dare take them out? Because you know all guys are about their stuff. And this little voice inside my head said, why not? <laughs> so I grabbed the golf clubs, met Pete at the golf course. We paid for our round of golf, threw the clubs on the, on the cart, made our way to the first tee. Got up onto the first tee box, I grabbed the, the driver, it was a par four, took the cover off the club and began to swing it to loosen up with the golf club. And I kid you not, the golf clubs were left-handed. <laughs> I know some of you thought I was probably gonna break the club. They were left-handed clubs. And my brother-in-law was left-handed. That explained a couple of things to me. Just kidding. I'm right-handed, he's left-handed. Now, I already told you, I saw the, club, the clubs up close and personal, but I really didn't pay much attention to them. I admired their beauty, but didn't realize that they were for a left-handed golfer. So I'm standing there on the tee box with this absolutely gorgeous driver in my hand, just a few feet away are the nicest set of golf clubs I had ever seen, and I can't use them. They're of absolute no value to me whatsoever, and I had to throw them back in my car, go to the pro shop, and I rented a nasty set of golf clubs and used them for that round. All right, story number two. Again, years ago, not quite as many years. This is probably a little over 20 years, maybe 22 years ago. My next door neighbor was going on vacation. He asked me if I would pick up his mail. I said, sure. And just before he left, he gave me a key to his house in the event of an emergency. Well, a couple of days later, UPS dropped off a sizable package on his porch, and I thought instead of dragging it all the way over to my house and then bringing it all the way back, I would just stick it on in his foyer. Opened the door, had the key, and that's when I noticed his monster TV screen. <laughs> Rear projection, 50-inch screen. I mean, th that kind of a TV probably cost eight to $10,000. I had never seen a TV screen like that before. These days, pretty much everyone has multiple flat screen, huge uh, TVs in their house. I think the national average is right around three screens per household. But back in those days, I had a incredibly small 25 inch TV that was housed in a wood cabinet. Remember that model? That was my TV. Well, after looking at that huge, gigantic screen, that little voice started in my head again, and I thought to myself, what would it be like to watch Barry Sanders play football on a screen that size? And so I just determined that I was going to watch football at his house that Sunday. I mean, he was still going to be gone for a couple of days. He had given me the key, right? I mean, I don't think he'd have a problem with it. And besides that, the timing was perfect. 
because Pastor Therese had a baby shower to go to. <laughs> she was going to go that afternoon so I wouldn't have to make up any stories or answer a bunch of questions. <laughs> Soon as she left, I went over to my neighbor's house. I was so excited. I couldn't wait. So much anticipation. When I got there, I noticed that he had three remote controls on the TV stand. And honestly, it took me a little while to turn the TV on. Um, I punched a, a bunch of buttons, the wrong ones, but finally got power to the TV. It lit up like a Christmas tree. The whole room was alive. And I said, here we go. But after a while, I couldn't get a picture. There was just a white screen, a snowy screen with a bunch of numbers on the bottom. And trust me when I tell you that I work those remotes <laughs> for almost an hour. And I was very diligent in my efforts, but it just wasn't happening. I couldn't get a picture. Can you believe that? I'm standing in front of this life-size, gigantic TV screen, never watched football on a screen this size, filled with so much expectation, and there's no picture. And I can't call my neighbor and ask him how to do it. <laughs> there were no YouTube tutorials available at that time. So I was very dejected as I went home, watched the second half of the Lions game on my miniature TV, and to add insult to injury, they lost. <laughs> I tell you those two stories this morning because in the passage that we just read, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1, as Jesus is talking to the church in Sardis, he says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. You look vibrant and full of life, but you're asleep at the wheel. Check it out. When you do the research and you look into the history like we've been doing over the past several weeks, from all outward appearance, Sardis was the place to be. They had a contemporary building, the church, with state-of-the-art facilities. The landscaping was impeccable all the way around the church. There were quality activities and events every day of the week and every night. Olympic game gold medal athletes were always giving their testimonies in Sardis. And the church had cutting edge technology, every church amenity you could possibly think of. In short, the church in Sardis had it all. And they were the talk of the town. If you were in a visitor in Sardis, it didn't matter where you went. To the grocery store, to the coffee shop, to the movie theater, to the farmer's market, you would have received multiple invitations to come out and check one of the worship services during the week. There was no church like the church in Sardis. But unfortunately, they had a huge problem. They were spiritual zombies. Jesus said so. Jesus called them a dead church. And keep in mind that this letter that Jesus was dictating, it was addressed to the pastor. Could you imagine uh, how the pastor must have been feeling when he opened that letter? Uh, to the pastor, uh, the church you're pastoring is a dead church, signed Jesus. I mean, in, when it comes to churches, could it get any worse than that? I could see an incompetent, ineffective, unfriendly, or stingy church, but a dead church? I think that would hurt my feelings. As a lifeless, pathetic church, as a church that had so much promise but yet in the spirit realm had nothing to give. 
Jesus said the church in its current state, even with all of its pomp and all of its splendor, was of no value to anyone, no spiritual value to anyone. And it certainly wasn't beneficial for the kingdom of God. Almost like left-handed golf clubs for a right-handed golfer or a huge TV screen with no picture. All you could really do was admire it. Certainly couldn't use it. Again, in this letter, Jesus said, you look good on the outside. You have an undeniable attraction. But the fact of the matter is you're dry, you're barren, and you're spiritually numb on the inside. How I many you know this is a sobering letter? In fact, when you read all the letters, it's probably the most shocking and the most stunning of them all. And as a passionate believer, somebody who understands the grace of God and the gospel message of Jesus, someone who wants to live their life with purpose for the kingdom of God, you cannot read this passage and blow it off. When you get into the study that we've been doing the last couple of weeks, and you read chapters 2 and 3, and you have a desire in your heart to please God, you cannot hear Jesus speak these words and not be moved emotionally. It's impossible to hear the Lord Jesus Christ say to the church that he loves so much, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're not. And this past week when I was doing the final preparations for this message, as I began to reread these words, just to refresh myself. I, I sensed that my heart was breaking on the inside, and I, I just cried out to the Lord. I said, why, Lord? What happened here? What caused Sardis to become spiritual Dollsville? And I believe the Spirit of the Lord responded to me. I believe that God spoke to me, and he said, Sardis got comfortable. They got comfortable and caught in the trap of complacency. You see, it wasn't some immoral, uh, some, uh, immoral failure on the part of the pastor or the elders. It wasn't uh, they, because they were corrupt or they, they, they did things they weren't supposed to do. It wasn't because there was some scandal in the church. They got comfortable. And they got caught in this whole trap of just going through the motions and living their lives just a normal, mediocre way. You see, in Sardis, there was little external persecution. And there was little to no political oppression. There were very few challenges in Sardis compared to uh, some of the experiences and struggles that the other churches were facing. Like bad doctrine, and false prophets in the spirit of Jezebel. We heard about that last week. The Sardians, they didn't even know who Jezebel was. And even if they did, they could care less. They didn't have to cry out to God. They didn't have to seek the Lord in desperation. Because in Sardis, life was good and they had it made. They were just breezing along through life in Sardis. Sardis, like many other cities in Bible times, was situated near a large hill. And in ancient Greece, that hill was called an Acropolis. And I have a picture to show you so you understand what I'm talking about. In the city of Sardis, there were several buildings. And... Sardis was actually built in the valley. The main city was built in the valley or near the bottom of the Acropolis. But they established living quarters on top of the Acropolis as well. Can you see that? Those upper living spaces were built in case of an emergency, like when the city was under attack from an opposing army. And so the city of Sardis was completely surrounded by this Acropolis, and it happened to be the highest and the steepest Acropolis in the ancient world. As such, Sardis was a very safe and secure place to live. 
Sardis was never forcibly overthrown by outside invasion. Invasion, by outside invasion. And the people living in Sardis, they enjoyed years and years of peace and quiet. If they were threatened in any way by any kind of a, an enemy, all they would do is simply go upstairs and lock the gates. And their natural landscape and impervious position kept them safe and sound. And so because of that cliff, again, the highest cliff, the steepest cliff uh, known, when they went to bed at night, they didn't have to worry. They didn't have to be afraid. They went to sleep in peace. Now, in addition to enjoying their built-in or natural fortress, Sardis was also a very wealthy city. In 550 BC, a resident of Sardis was crowned king. His name is Croesus, and King Croesus became the richest man in the known world. Can, can you imagine, can you believe that? That the, the wealthiest and richest man in the world lived in Sardis. And Croesus made all of his money by being the first person to design and develop a modern and usable gold coin. In Sardis, there were silver and gold mineral deposits. And Croesus was able to figure out a way to convert those minerals into coins. And he weighed them out, he stamped them with an image, and he made them available to the Grecians. And that invention enabled him to become the famous and wealthy king of Sardis. And so the people living in Sardis, they lived in peace. Crime was very low. They didn't have to worry much about uh, attacks of the enemy. The economy was good. They enjoyed life there. And furthermore, because they paid so much revenue to Rome, Rome pretty much left the church alone. They didn't persecute the church like they did just a few miles away in Smyrna. We learned that a couple of weeks ago. In Smyrna, they were killing Christians, lighting them on fire for the fun of it. But in Sardis, they looked the other way. You see, the church in Sardis had very few trials. They didn't have the trouble or the tension some of their other brothers and sisters had in the surrounding church, in, in, in the surrounding area. They didn't have to deal with the struggles and the adversity that they were dealing with in Smyrna or in Ephesus or in Pergamum. They didn't have to gather the elders together and schedule prayer and fasting times out of desperation for the Lord. They didn't call emergency board of directors meetings to try and solve some problems that were going on in the church. They never had to make contact with their bank and, and try to renegotiate or refinance their loan. They didn't have those problems in Sardis. Again, they had it made, and they just breezed right through life. And stormless living neutralized their faith. That's what the Holy Spirit of God dropped in my heart when I began to ask him what happened here. Stormless living neutralized their faith. And friend, as much as we fight it, and as much as we loathe the discomfort of it, the scriptures teach us that the storms of life are essential in the development of our faith. The storms of life help us to point in the direction of God. And it's the adversity that we face that cause and compel our faith roots to go down deep. And if you don't believe me, listen to a couple of verses of Scripture. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy. What kind of joy? Not just joy. Pure joy. Perfect joy. My brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
trials and tests in our life, struggles and adversity, the storms that we face from time to time, they help us to be complete spiritually and not have lack. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 says, So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. What shows that your faith is genuine? The trials and the tests that we face. It creates in us sincere faith and real faith and, and, and deep faith. It, your faith, Peter says, is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. One more, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. Paul writing, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. Ever feel that way? Yeah, the last two years. Indeed, Paul said, we felt we had received the sentence of death. That's how bad it got. We thought for sure we were going to die. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves. This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. But on God. But on God. Friends, what are we supposed to do when we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place? Paul says that's the very place where we learn to depend upon God and rely upon him. That's the place where we learn to make a turn toward God and to know that he's there for us and that he will deliver us. Tests and trials that we face, they make us more aware of God's faithfulness. They teach us just how committed God is to us. And it's when we diligently pursue God during the storms of life, not remain neutral, but pursue God, that's what increases our spiritual life and maturity. That wasn't happening in Sardis. What caused Jesus to write such a passionate and sobering letter, that wasn't happening. See, the coins of Croesus and the comfort of Acropolis living lulled the people to sleep spiritually. Just rocked them to sleep. Everything's good. And in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 2, Jesus cries out with as much passion and mercy that he could possibly express, he says to them, wake up. For God's sake, wake up. Church in Sardis, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. Jesus' advice to the church in Sardis was to, to try and identify and rally around the one area in the church that was still operating with some level of spirituality, some, some level of excellence, and then to try and revive it, to do everything that they possibly could to make sure the lone thing in the church that wasn't yet dead wouldn't die. He basically said, in essence, it's time to come alive. That's his word to the church in Sardis when you look at it in the Greek and when you study it. And when you understand the message and what was happening there, Jesus basically said, it's time to come alive. Amen. And that's precisely what he said in John chapter 11. When he stood at the tomb of Lazarus. Yes. Lazarus had been dead and buried four days. And Jesus showed up. He called him back from the dead. He stood outside that grave and he said, Lazarus, come forth. In other words, Lazarus, wake up. And you know the story. He came out of that tomb like a walking mummy, still wrapped up in grave clothes. And the people who witnessed that resurrection miracle, they were besides themselves. They could not believe what had just happened. They witnessed an incredible resurrection miracle. 
And the scripture tells us that because of the resurrection of Lazarus, some of the Jewish people who had rejected the message of Jesus now did a 180 and they began to put their trust in him and to have faith in Jesus. And I mean, know oh, that's a good thing. They began to follow after Jesus. But when you've read this account in the past, or have you heard it told, have you ever thought or considered what happened here from Lazarus' perspective? From his point of view? I mean, sure, Jesus raised him from the dead and gave him a wonderful, powerful testimony. But he had to die to get it. He had to endure all that pain and all that agony. Not to the point of death, he died. I could just imagine him saying, Lord, why me? Why did you give Martha and Mary, my sisters, a pass? Why did I have to die? You see, the normal, everyday tests and trials that we face, the storms of life that we walk through, the most difficult times that we can endure as human beings, it points us in the direction of God. It teaches us that God is faithful and he can be trusted and we can look to him to be with us regardless of what we go through. And those experiences, the scripture says, make us stronger. But you know, sometimes when we're in the middle of these unpleasant situations and we're going through the trials, that's when the devil tries to wheel, weasel his way in and convince us that God doesn't care about us, that God has abandoned us, He's not pleased with us for some reason. He's removed his, his grace and his mercy from us. And instead of making a move toward God, what do we do? We move away from God. Instead of being filled with faith, we start to be filled with doubts. And mishandled trials can have the same effect as little to no trials. We become dry and barren and spiritually numb on the inside, and it has happened to a world of Christian people. And Jesus is speaking loud and clear to the church today, just like he did to the church in Sardis. Time to come alive. It's time to turn to him, not a slight turn, a dramatic turn, and come alive. Let's bow our heads and prepare for communion. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. You are so alive and it's so tangible. Lord, I, I can sense it. I can sense you moving among your people. And Lord, what we've been asking you, what we're praying right now is that this communion service today would be different than past communion services. Lord, I appeal to you, I, I beg of you, that we would not just go through the motions of receiving the bread and the cup one more time, but there would be life change that would take place this morning. Lord, we appeal to you as only you can do. We know it's not by might or by power, but it's by your spirit. And Lord, this is what we've been hearing week after week after week since the start of the year, that we need the Holy Spirit among us. We're asking you, Lord God, in these closing moments to perform some miracles. That, Lord, you would do something deep in our hearts. That you would change us from the inside out, Lord. There are people here right now that need to be rocked spiritually, Lord. Because the enemy has tried to rock us to sleep. But I pray, oh God, that you would pour out your miraculous presence upon us. That as we remind ourselves of what you did for us a long time ago, you would transform lives. That's our prayer, Lord. We make ourselves available. We surrender ourselves to you. And we ask, Lord God, for you to visit us in a very special way this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
the words to that song are basically the same words that Jesus spoke to the church in Sardis. And from my perspective, precisely the message the Holy Spirit is speaking to the church today. We need the breath of God to breathe on us again. You know, the scripture tells us way back in Genesis that God breathed on creation. They became a living soul. The Holy Spirit continued to breathe throughout uh, the Bible into the book of Acts. We need another experience of the Spirit of God breathing on us. And the only way that we can do that is by making a turn to Him. Throughout this series, we'll continue to do it for the next couple of weeks. We will appeal to you to make a turn toward God. It has to be significant. We have to be willing to surrender to Him and say, Holy Spirit of God, I need you. Jesus knew we couldn't do this in and of ourselves. He knew that we needed help. Now we're gonna receive the bread and the cup in just a few moments, but before we do, uh, there was a statement that Jesus made in the letter to the church in Sardis, and I referenced it when I read the passage earlier. I, I commented on it briefly, but I didn't comment, it, comment on it during the message. I can't ignore it. That verse says to the people who would be willing to turn their hearts toward God, walk in victory, and come alive. Jesus said, I promise you, I'll never remove your name from the Lamb's book of life. In, in other words, your name will forever and always be in that book. How many of you know that's important? If there is one thing that you do in this life, from the time that you're alive on the earth, get your name in that book. Make sure that you have been written, your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. Because the scripture is very clear in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15. Here's what it says. This is why people respond positively to that verse. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15 says, on the day of judgment, and trust me, there's a judgment coming. We serve a very just God. He's loving, he's merciful, he, he loves us unconditionally, but he's a just God, he's a holy God. A day of judgment is coming, and the scripture clearly says, on that day of judgment, if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, you will be remanded to the lake of fire for all eternity. That would be your eternal destination the lake of fire. And you may hear me make a statement like that and get a little angry or upset. Or may, maybe fear will hit you or maybe you'll just roll your eyes and mock me. When I make a statement like that and I read a verse of scripture like Revelation 20, 15, you should be asking yourself one question and one question only. How do I get my name in that book? And I'll tell you how. It's really what this communion service is all about. It's why we tell it over and over again. It's why Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Every month, we remind you of the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross. You get your name in the Lamb's Book of Life by repenting of your sins, genuinely and sincerely repenting of your sins and believing the gospel message of Jesus Christ, namely that he went to the cross and died for our sins, but he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he was raised to life again and he overcame death, hell, and the grave. Yeah. That's the salvation story. Receiving that, accepting that, believing that, that gets your name in the book. See, the scripture says it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my body which is for you. This bread that you're holding in your hand was a type of the broken body of Jesus Christ. And a few hours later, after Jesus had said that, his body was mutilated beyond recognition, crushed to the point of death. 
He did that so we wouldn't have to be crushed. Jesus went to the cross so that we would have eternal life with him forever and ever. I tell you this all the time. I like to make this comment at funerals too. Death was never supposed to be a part of the human package. God never had that in mind when he put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But they messed up and they sinned. And because of their sin, death entered the human race. And it affects us all. And since Jesus, as badly as he wanted to, could not fix the sin problem, couldn't go back and undo it, he did the next best thing and died for our sins. He died for my sin. He died for your sin. He died that we might have life. Believing that and not just acknowledging it, but allowing a revelation of that sacrifice to come into your life, get your name in that book. And so can I just get you to bow your heads for a moment? I'm not going to stretch this out. I sense it in my heart that the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to some of you. I'm going to give them opportunity to allow you to make a decision. People here in the room, those of you who are watching, listening to me, days later, it doesn't matter. If you would say to me, Tony, I don't know that my name is in that book, but I want to do that today. I want to make sure I get that done today. Can I get you to raise your hand? Thank you. Just hold it up for a second. Let God see it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Those of you who are listening to me, there's a salvation tab. You can just hit that tab or you can type it in the chat. I'm raising my hand. I'm giving my life to the Lord. I want to make sure that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, not only to secure my place in eternity with the Father, but also to understand what this sacrifice is all about. Lord, I turn my life over to you. And Father, I thank you for the hands that were raised. I thank you for those that will raise them in days to come when they hear this message. Holy Spirit of God, you are faithful. Thank you for the greatest miracle that we could ever have, the miracle of salvation. It's taking place here right now, Lord. We thank you as lives are being transformed from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of your dear son. What a powerful expression, Lord. Thank you. Let's take the bread together. Scripture says after supper had ended, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks. He passed the cup to his disciples and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death till he comes. This cup that you hold in your hand right now, it represents the new covenant that God made with us through his son, Jesus Christ. How many know it's an everlasting covenant can never be broken? And once you understand what the bread is all about, once you bow your knee at the cross, confess the Lordship of Jesus Christ like we did just a few moments ago, then it makes the covenant cup available to you. Once you receive the bread, then it's turn for the cup. And the covenant cup promises us the very best that God has to offer. Last time, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. If you're in this place this morning, you're listening to me, you're watching, and you would say, I'm dry on the inside. I'm barren. Pastor, truth be told, I'm numb. I'm spiritually numb. I don't know how it happened. I don't know where it came from. Maybe it's lack of trials in your life. Maybe it's mishandled trials. There could be a whole reason, but you just feel that dryness and you want to come alive, understanding you can't do it by yourself. You need God to help you. You want to come alive. Can I get you to just slip up your hand and put it back down? Thank you. Thank you. Father, see these hands. Holy Spirit of God, breathe on your people. Breathe life, Lord, into the dry bones. There's so much in this world 
that beats us down and trips us up and tries to rob us of our faith and neutralize our faith, Lord. I'm asking, Holy Spirit of God, for miracles of transformation this morning. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's take the cup together.